Well, good morning and welcome back to City Line. As you can see, the cool cafe cats have moved to the comfy couch. I can't even believe I got that out of my mouth just now. And I didn't trip over it. That was impressive. It's All really right, good. let's introduce the three of you. Um, right here to talk about the Teen Dating Violence Backslash Action Month that is sponsored by the YWCA of Pierce County. Sojourner Duxbury, what a great name. You are the Education and Prevention Manager of the YWCA here in Pierce County. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's good to have you. You brought some, some, some buddies along with you. This beautiful, sparkly woman, um, Shamaya Anderson. You are Youth Advocate, Education and Prevention for the same YWCA of Pierce County. Welcome, my dear. Thank you. And then rounding out the end of the couch, Ray Ward, Youth Advocate, Education and Prevention for the same YWCA. Welcome, 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 all three of you. Thank you. Let's get into this. So, whoo. How do you define teen dating violence, Shamaya? Because it's such a fragile topic. It can be so easily misunderstood. And sometimes we don't know it until we are in it or we have witnessed it. So give us the 411. What is it? Absolutely. So teen dating violence, by definition, uh, is when a partner or someone, a young person, is in a, a talking stage with, possibly, is um, either using physical, emotional, financial, or sexual abuse to try and gain and maintain some form of power and control over that person. And we always flag for students that it's not just... Um, a fight every once in a while, but as a pattern of unhealthy behaviors. And that, doesn't, that pattern doesn't have to look like every single day, right? The distance between occurrences doesn't matter. What matters is that there's a continuing or escalating level of behaviors that makes a student feel uncomfortable or unsafe in yeah. that relationship. And, and you said that so beautifully and so calmly, and I wish that that could be infused into what we're seeing on the headlines right now, because it, it is every single day we are dealing with this. So, Sojourner, statistically, how often are teens experiencing dating violence? Because also, dating is very different when I dated in the 80s, <laughs> yes. okay? Because um, some of the people go, well, well those, those issues weren't around back then. I'm like, yes, they were. They just look different. So, statistically, how much are we experiencing here in terms of dating violence? Yeah, a stat that we like to use um, is typically about one in seven uh, teens will experience dating violence uh, by the time or before they're 18. One um, in seven. Yeah. Okay. One, two, three, four of us right here on the couch. So make that, yeah, there you go. One in seven. It's actually one in seven men uh, who will report uh experiencing violence in their relationships. Um, and we have about a one in two statistic for queer folks in their relationships as well. Um, and then we have uh, a one in three on average statistic of one, one in every three people we see in the classroom uh, statistically is probable that they have experienced dating violence already in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. Ray, what might be the difference or different for LGBTQ teens who experience teen dating violence? Because the stat was very, very different than yeah. what it was for male reporting. Um, I mean, one, what was it, one to two it was? One in two. One in two, and that's a very intimate. So is that, is that part of where it starts of the difference? It is part of where it starts. I think part of it too is just any time that you have compounding multiple identities um, and intersecting identities, uh, you are going to find that marginalized people are going to experience violence at a higher rate. Um, and so that is true within various different um, communities, but for the queer community, it, it presents itself very, um, yeah, very <laughs> heavily in that statistic of one in two. Yeah. And some of the big indicators for, um, for queer youth a lot of them are, um, you know, they're only out in certain spaces or they're figuring out where they can be out of the closet. Um, Safe. And, exactly, safely. Yes. And so that, that becomes part of the dynamic is um, the threat of, well, I'm going to out you if you don't do X, Y, Z. Um, there's also the, just the fact that suicide rates within um, queer teens is the highest 
period. It's the highest rate of suicide that we have um, in the day, in the current day. Uh, so it's huge when you add any kind of dating violence on top of that, you know, youth of the queer experience are already experiencing that intense isolation just right. because they don't know where they can be safe and feel safe. Exactly. And so you add that dating violence on top of it and it, it creates an even more unsafe environment for, um, for those young people. So yeah. now more than ever, it's important to make sure that we're taking care oh. of queer youth and as, as, a, as a mother of two queer daughters, and I myself am a lesbian, that was that big sigh of, yeah. oh my gosh, yes, every single day. I, I worry, I, and, I, and I think about safety, and yeah. that's not new for anybody, but it just feels like it's really, um, it's a tsunami right now. So, Shamaya, based upon what Ray knows about LGBTQ violence, let's talk about violence with teens in terms of a youth of color who can experience this. How are the stats different? So specifically when we talk about youth of color, it's really um, access to supports, right? So Ray talked about um, uh, the intersecting identities that can make it difficult for someone to even feel safe in a space, right? When, you, when we talk about youth of color, it's not having access to a safe space, but also systemically the world around them is also built for them to not exist in it, right? Yes. And so um, when we have specific conversations of sometimes you talk to young people and just like, oh, call the police. Well, if I'm in a situation and I am a young black or brown person. You're not calling the police. I'm probably, it, they're, they're not my first uh, Not your my first, first resource, space, yeah. Right, um, and so specifically, um, when working with young people of color, it's making sure that we have culturally affirming uh, spaces that make sure that we are taking in the nuances of uh, folks' households, the nuances of um, the things that they may have internalized, not just from the world around them, but from uh, the relationships that they already hold dear in their lives. Exactly. Uh, and it's also making sure that um, our young folks of color don't feel as though um, their violence should be normalized like the violence mm -hmm. that exists in the systems around them, right? Yes. Uh, they deserve safety uh, as much as they deserve love. Yes. Oh, there it is. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. So, Sojourner, you, all of you, this trinity of education and, and sacred places, um, you all provide a single dose educational curriculum on teen dating violence. Can you tell us more about that content and how it got distilled down also into just a single, single dose? Yeah, um, so we provide to local area high schools and also community groups, other service providers. Um, we do teen dating violence presentations, and it really is a high level overview of what to look and listen for. Um, a lot of what we cover involves like myths and facts about dating violence. So we'll start with kind of a game, uh, agree, disagree, just to see where people are at. Oh yeah, um, take in their, the temperature and yes. like, okay, what do you know? Absolutely. Uh, and then we go into um, some scenarios. So once we identify warning signs, um, elements of power and control that exist in unhealthy relationships, then we go through a handful of scenarios where we're trying to pick out and identify what is happening uh, within the relationships that we're reviewing. And then we top it all off with healthy communication tips because we know that conflict is normal in relationships. Yes. Uh, and so giving a handful of tips like making eye contact or, or showing somebody that you're listening in a conflict, things like that. So you, you also uh, provide pre prevention curriculum as well because um, there's a fine line in, in the sense of educating about it in a single dose but also recognizing it and preventing it. Mm -hmm. um, and tell us about just that little prevention shift that you do. Yeah, so a little bit of the difference between a single dose education like teen dating violence, um, that is intended to kind of shift the cultural awareness, give a shared language, um, words that we're using so we're all on the same page about what we're experiencing, what's happening, and that makes the dialogue more um, accessible. And then when we're talking about prevention, it's essentially a stacking curriculum. So it's really yeah. anything that contributes to more learning on a larger subject. And so we cover topics like privilege and oppression um, involved in how these layers uh, involve and impact our relationships. Um, and we talk about gender identity and stereotypes, sex and consent, uh, media literacy. Um, and we also talk about the fun stuff like healthy relationships. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there, there's so much I want to ask you and I want you here for the whole hour. Um, and, and I don't always 
to get what I want on this set. So um, I'm going to jump to the question that I, I really want to hear from all three of you. So let's start with you, Ray, and then Shamaya, and then Sojourner. Um, I want to hear a success story or an aha story um, that you can share in terms of the moments of the work that you're doing with youth, Ray. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, every time we go into a classroom, there's bound to be one or two students who will stop us on the way out and yes. give us that really heartfelt thank you um, that is different than your typical, like, oh, have a nice day, thank you. It's like a thank you, I needed this. You see me. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that is, I mean, that's why we do what we do. Even if it's a rowdy class that you don't feel like <laughs> is listening, they if you are. get that one student that needed to hear it, it's all worth it. Um, and I think my, my biggest aha was having a student come up and say, I'm going to take this home and talk to my parent about this. There we go. Like just the fact that it can impact yeah. intergenerationally is, um, is huge as well. So your work here, your work there is done. Exactly. Shamaya, what, what rings true for you about an aha moment? Oh, I'd say from prevention, we do a Healthy Love two-week course, and we had a freshman student uh, take it twice. And the first time, like, they didn't say a word to us the whole time. <laughs> uh, and the second time, they didn't talk during class, but after, during our breaks, they would come up and specifically ask questions and yes. check on their own personal relationships and try to, like, actually help the other people around them too that they were close with, which Boy, was really awesome. That growth. That is incredible. So Jerner, what's, what's, what's your take on this in this last 20 um, seconds here? I think for me, a really significant moment, we had a student who participated in Healthy Love and one of his identified goals or like what he wanted to get out of the program um, was knowledge and understanding about how to be in a good and healthy relationship. <sighs> and he had not been in a relationship up to that point. And so he came back for a second round of Healthy Love and introduced us to his girlfriend. Uh, and they had a really sweet and lovely relationship and I'm glad that we could give him the skills oh, for that. I love that. So I I want to redirect folks to the website for all interior opportunities and the list of people um, who have touched this program that we want to say thank you to. And I want to say three things to each of you. Never stop shining. You three are incredible. Thank you for the work that you're doing, for the hearts that you're healing, and for the solutions that you are standing in. And I want to have you back on this couch sooner than later, okay? All right. We've got Andy in the City Line Comfort Cafe over there. We're going to do some musical chairs and we'll be right back with more on City Line.